Our speaker today is Erika Roldan. Uh, she's uh, currently a Marie uh, Curie Fellow uh, within the Eurotech postdoc program at the Techn Technische Universität München and at the EPFL Lausanne. She has a very big uh, in, in, uh, research interests, which include biomathematics, stochastics, topology, topological and geometric data analysis, and much more. Uh, she was uh, or is uh, a founder of the BAMM, BAM, uh, the Ohio State University Outreach Program for Mathematics, co-founded also uh, the Hypothesis in uh, New York City in 2020, Morphosis at CIMAT, Mexico 2011, and Music Math in Mexico 2013. And all of these projects uh, intend to promote mathematics and, and people joining STEAM sciences. Um, and without further ado, I will pass over to you, Erika, to talk about shuffling polynomials. Thanks, Diego, and uh, thanks also. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start thinking about the uh, yeah G4G. I wanna, I wanna say some things about it, but first I have to do a, a a brief intro that I'm compromised to do every time because of my fellowship. So yeah, this project is receiving funding from European Union's um, Horizon. And yeah, I have a Mercury uh, a grant uh, that is from the agreement number 75 or 46. Okay. I would like to say that uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, this is a quote with which I open uh, as well my PhD thesis that I defended three years ago. And it's toys are not really as innocent as they look. Toys and games are precursors uh, to serious ideas uh, by Charles Hans. And uh, I guess this is um, one of the, um, uh, the gathering for Gardner and, and all the people that follow it uh, are very much into this uh, philosophy. And uh, before starting uh, with the talk, I wanna say uh, some things about uh, Martin Gardner. And I want to say that my first encounter, encounter with him was when I was a teenager and it was through a book only. Uh, it was in Mexico then. And actually I left school after uh, finishing middle school uh, to become a professional soccer player. I'm not a professional soccer player now, but uh, yeah, I kind of was for several years. Um, and then I found this book, um, Los Porqués de un Escriba Filosofo. And it's a book like this. It's translated, it was translated in Spanish. I, I actually didn't know that he was uh, from the USA. And um, yeah, I just, uh, it changed my, it, yeah, it put my world inside out. Uh, and this was the first encounter with Martin Garner, the first impact that he had uh, in my life. And then, um, yeah, gathering for Garner was the, the, the second time that I, I was, uh, that my life was kind of changed by, by Garner and all the community that is around him. So uh, when I was an undergrad uh, and a master's student and a PhD student in Mexico, the first uh, research community that uh, were very welcoming and with whom uh, I was able to talk about research and to approach mathematicians with, with open questions uh, was at G4D. Thanks to the generosity of the grants that they give, uh, I was able as, uh, as a student in Mexico to go and travel. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, a, lot, a lot of names that I'm, I'm very grateful to, Como Kahi, Nancy uh, Blackman, uh, Neil Kakni, um, and then David Singmaster, I met him and I met a lot of great mathematicians as well as, uh, as, as all of them. Um, and yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm very grateful to the G4G. So now let's start uh, with the topic. So we're going to talk about polyominoes. And polyominoes, uh, I think, is, is, uh, is our, our structures, geometric structures and combinatorial structures that we love uh, at G4G. And so it's, it's the, the, basic, uh, the basic building block is a square. And so you can have uh, one square. And then this is a polyomino with one square. You can have polyominoes with two squares. 
Uh, you can have polyominoes with three squares, like all of these, and these are called triominoes, these are called dominoes. Uh, I guess a lot of, of people have played dominoes um, that are labeled with dots, and then there are a lot of games with it. And um, yeah, so all of these are polyominoes. I want to say what is not a polyomino. Uh, so these are not polyominoes. This is not a polyomino, and this is not a polyomino. Uh -huh. And uh, so by the pictures, you could kind of um, guess what is the definition of a polyomino. Mathematically, a polyomino is a subset of squares that has a connected interior. Um, uh, but also uh, polyominoes before being defined uh, like mathematically uh, rigorous were uh, already in books on recreational mathematics. And this is one of the examples. They were already famous in 1907. And, and this is the, the 74th Canterbury puzzle. And uh, I found this when I was reading the Canterbury puzzles by Henry Durney. I think it's a classic on um, recreational mathematics. I suggest it very much. Uh, if you read it and you can see it's, the, it's, a, it's a chess board um, that's, that was uh, smashed in the head of uh, of of the player who won, and then it broke into pieces. And you can see here the pentominos with five squares, all the pentominos, and you can see here one tetromino. And we will go back to tetrominos. And yeah, so the first time, as far as I know, that in a mathematical uh, research talk, polyominos were introduced were was in 1954 by Solomon W. Gollum. And he defined an n omino uh, as a polyomino with n squares, or, or, or as a root wise connected subset of n squares of the infinite uh, checkerboard. So, so that means that if you put a rook uh, on a polyomino, you can visit all other uh, squares of the polyomino with rook moves. Mm -hmm. So that means only moving on uh, on rows or columns, and you will be able to visit all of them. Okay, so also please, I want to say, uh, interrupt me anytime uh, if there are some questions. Um, and as um, I, I don't know what people think, but I think that uh, one of the most famous polyominoes are the tetrominoes. Uh, and I want to let people to think about where do we encounter them, but meanwhile, I'm going to name them. Um, so this is going to be the L uh, polyomino, this is going to be the J polyomino, and you could say, yeah, I could take the L polyomino to the J polyomino. Uh, well, yeah, only if I allow you to put it out of the screen, right, and flip it. So right now for, for the tetrominoes, they're called one-sided if we only allow rotations and, well, of course, translations to consider them as equal. Uh, so this is the O polyomino, I polyomino, T polyomino, Z polyomino, S polyomino. Mm -hmm. So let's put them a name. And um, yeah, you guessed correctly. Uh, they are very famous because of Tetris. One of the historical things that I, uh, that I like learning from Tetris was that during the Cold War, um, Tetris is coming from Russia, and then Nintendo in, was in the USA or is in the USA, and then uh, they decided to, to, to make this uh, collaboration and buy the game, and then they, they asked for putting from Russia with fun during the Cold War, uh, that this was uh, 885. Um, yeah, so, so we all have or most of us, I think, we have played uh, with tetrominoes, polyominoes with four squares. And now, uh, one of the questions that I promised to answer is, um, how do we get the next piece when we're playing Tetris? So let's play Tetris. Let's play once. And what I'm going to do is, um, so we have a very, a very good player. And this player can go on and don't lose, uh, can take uh, 700 pieces in Tetris without losing. Uh -huh. Let's say that I record each one of the pieces that the game is giving to this player. And starting from here, the first piece was the, the I piece, and then the L, the Z, the T is the O, Z, I is T. 
T O L J J da 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 da. Okay, so this was one game, and then um, we go to another computer, and then we have the same player playing, and we record again, and this is the record that we get. Mm -hmm. So, a uh, question here would be: mm, Are were these two games giving the tiles, or the the pieces, the the terminal pieces? With the same uh, with the same procedure algorithm, um, and then uh, I, I would like us to to have a look a, a bit here. And actually, if someone wants to wants to uh, just unmute and say, yeah, I think they were from the same algorithm or not. I think they were not uh, produced in the same way. So let's uh, give just uh, 30 seconds, uh, because anyways, people who is watching the video, I also want them to think about it, just to look at both and to see if it's possible to spot properties that can tell us, yes, they're coming from the same procedure or not, they should be coming from a different algorithm. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna then uh, go ahead and, and, and answer if, if no one raised a hand. So one of the things that we could observe uh, here is, for example, um, uh, how much is each one of the of the pieces repeated. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we count how many times the piece was repeated here, uh, so we can see, oh, JJ was repeated here, so two times repeated J. And then I guess we could try to spot other places. So it happens uh, sometimes, and then we find, for example, okay, here is the II piece. Mm -hmm. And then we can go to the other one and then say, okay, do we have uh, two repetitions? Yes, LL here. Oh, but we have LLL here. Apparently, there is no parts of the first, um, the first recording of the pieces that give us uh, three in a row. So uh, this could be like a flag, red flag saying uh, these two perhaps are not coming from the, from the same procedure. And no, these are not coming from the same procedure. Uh, so this very procedure, what it does, and you can, you, can, you can go with me. So let's see, let's, let's count. We know there are seven pieces. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If we look at the first seven, all of them appear there. So all the seven different pieces appear here. So if it's something that is random, it's something that is random, but it's allowing the seven pieces to appear there. And if we go here, uh, we have uh, we don't have the seven pieces at the at the first uh, in the first seven. Um, we we don't have the whole uh, tetrominus in the first seven pieces that the game gave us. So uh, what's happening? It's uh, I'm going to tell you the first one is the one that Tetris uses in the games. So what they do is they take always seven pieces, the seven pieces of, uh, of the, the seven tetrominos, and um, they, they shuffle them, the seven pieces, and then they give you the seven pieces just like uh, in not in the same order every time. Uh -huh. Actually, they, you, they do it uniformly random. So we know there are seven factorial ways of, uh, of giving you a vector with these seven pieces in different order. So each one of these, uh, of these ones is selected with one over seven factorial. Uh, and then they give you this, the next, uh, another, uh, another package of seven and another package of seven. And, and one of the properties that this um, is giving is that uh, you will not be able to go farther than, than, than 13 more pieces without observing the same piece. And this is good because sometimes we want like to kill a lot of, a lot of rows, right? And then if we have the, the, the I one, it allows us to kill four in the same at the same time. And then we will not wait for more than 30 times to, to get this piece again. Now, this second one, this is every time I choose one of the of the seven possible pieces, uh, tetrominos, with probability one over seven. 
So then the seven pieces that the, the seven pieces have equal probability uh, now uh, to, to be selected at every time. So it's independent. Uh, we call them IID, independent and identically distributed every time. And this is how we get pieces. And we can see here that sometimes we're going to get three L's in a row. Actually, we can get as, as many in a row as, as one could uh, desire if we play long enough, right? This is like a lot of probability going on here. OK. So um, I answered the question that I promised to answer. Uh, what, what is the procedure that they use to give us the pieces in, in Tetris? Now, I really think that they have thought about the procedure, uh, the Tetris developers, very much. Like, no one will like to play one with uniformly random uh, choosing the pieces. Okay, it will really dramatically change the game. So just if someone uh, wants to just for fun, try this. Uh, here is the, um, the code for Python. So just uh, copy paste, and then you will be able to run uh, as many pieces as you want and observe or have uh, make some um, statistical experiments with them. Okay, now let's imagine that you want to play Tetris with anominos, uh, polyominos with n tiles, but with n bigger than four. Uh -huh. um, okay, so let's look at polyominos, for example, with five tiles. Okay, there are 12. They are actually the 12, uh, 12 of the 13 pieces that we saw in the puzzle that you uh, break a chess, a chess board. Okay, so there are 12. Um, now it's our free polyominos. Uh, I just want to say that now we we don't count them as different if we reflect that if if we count them as different we will have many much more but right now let's not count them like that so we have for five squares we have twelve for six squares we have thirty five uh, for seven we have one hundred and eight so can you imagine like it starts getting uh, uh, like the the procedure that they use uh, from the Tetris game it will be like for n equals seven, if you want to play with dominoes, will be like I give you a list uh, every time. I think I give you a list of one hundred and eight, um, and uh, with with different orders. Each one of these uh, selected with probability one over um, one hundred and eight factorial, <laughs> and yeah, so it it starts getting a little bit complicated. And in principle, I would say okay. But if we know if we know the pieces, we could, uh, in principle, program it. Well, not exactly because uh, polyominoes start getting uh, exponentially more and more and more when we let the number of squares uh, grow. And uh, one of the things that uh, we mathematicians um, don't know is. For example, how many polyominoes there are for n bigger than 56? And actually, if we're knowing up to 56, it took a lot of uh, computational time, I think at least two, two years. Um, um, yep, but we, we know they grow exponentially fast. And uh, so, so uh, it should be if, if a n represents the number of polyominoes. Then uh, the form of this formula with respect to n will be something like c lambda to the n n to the theta, uh, with c a constant, but we don't know. We have no idea. Uh, uh, theta we think is minus one. It's not proven yet. And lambda we have a guess that is around four point zero six five da da And we have some very very narrow uh, window of constants that have been proved, but we, we don't know exactly how many there are for n bigger than 56. So if, if we don't know the elements of a set, how do we do this kind of giving you a random element? Uh, this is, uh, this is what, what we want to now to explore. What if I don't know the pieces with, 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 tet with tetrominos, we know the pieces and we could decide uh, different uh, ways of giving you randomly or randomly giving you pieces, but now that we don't know the set, how do we do it? Then I will let you to think about it for 30 seconds. Um, we cannot use any of the two algorithms that we just said.
Um, so if, there, if no one wants to like guess a way to do it, I would propose uh, right now a way that it's, it's not a very good way of doing it, but it's a way of doing it. There is a comment in the chat which says yeah. create polynomial uh, polyominies uh, randomly from single squares. Polyno polyominoes, sorry, my, my mistake. Uh, so to create them randomly from single squares. Yeah, that. Uh, so uh, let me go to that uh, to that comment uh, at the end. I'm going to show pictures of that model. So the model could be like I have a square and then I choose uniformly random one of the possible that are neighboring, right? Because the point is that we have to keep the thing uh, connected in the sense of rooks movements or in the sense of, uh, or, or equivalently uh, having a connecting interior. So very, very nice comment. I'm gonna go back to another way of building them. Now, let me, let me present one before that is very famous among the, mathematical community that is uh, studying uh, percolation uh, uh, models. So choose one P between zero and one. Uh -huh. So uh, take, take a, a number between zero and one, and this is representing a probability. Now imagine that we are in the infinite square grid, okay? So we have a plane and we have an infinite amount of squares, okay? And so in each one of the squares, you stand up, and you throw, uh, and, and with probability P, you put a, a tile there, you put a square, and with probability one minus P, you don't put it. And so imagine that you are like super powerful and you can do this at the same time in each one of the squares of the infinite square tessellation of the plane. Uh -huh. So uh, let's say that we look at a, at a small window that, that you have generated with your superpowers. And then we say, okay, now we have a bunch of squares some in some squares uh, of the infinite tessellation and, some, and some, some of them are not present. And we could actually go and say, uh, look, if I look at the components that are rookwise connected or with connected interior, I could find polyominoes with different tiles, of course. Here is one with five, here is one with two, here is one with one. Right, so in a way, I cannot control if I only look at a window uh, how many squares uh, the components are going to have. So it's kind of um, it's, it's going to be like kind of difficult to to try to to sample them like this, uh, but it will definitely be possible because if we do it in the infinite uh, in the infinite square grid, uh, for sure there is going to be uh, infinite amount uh, with it with each amount of tiles. Uh, now this is getting a little bit perhaps uh, uh, philosophical and it gives dizziness. But yes, but this is not a way of doing it. But it's just if someone wants to have a particular P that everyone is used to, a coin. When you flip a coin, usually it is close to 0.5 or P P equals 0.5 or, or one half. And so you could take your coin and go and do this in every square of the infinite square grid. And uh, yeah. Um, okay, so um, here is a question. So we already know that when we give the same probability or when we want to have each one of the elements of a set with, uh, uh, with the same chance of being selected, uh, we need to assign the same probability to each one uh, to be selected. So a question would be, okay, imagine that I, I do use this procedure to generate a random polynomial. Do you think there is a P, a probability that you can select so, such that you will be able to sample from a uniform distribution here uh, with N tiles? Yeah, fixing N. I'm going to go back to that, but that, that is a question. Is the uniform distribution part of this infinite family of ways of um, uh, making uh, experiments to generate polyominoes? That, that was uh, not very useful. Um, okay, that was not a very good idea, but uh, I, wanna, I wanna present here an idea that um, everyone has done it perhaps here. Everyone has played cards. 
Um, and at least I, I knew about this before uh, knowing what probability is, and this is shuffling cards, right? So when one is playing uh, games with cards, in particular with a deck of cards, uh, the usual 52 cards um, uh, with four uh, peers, uh, one wants to have like um, a random, a random uh, position of the cards to be able to to play it, um, yeah. So so we have developed uh, humans even before it was modeled actually, and mathematically modeled ways of doing this. Mm -hmm. And I've I've learned it from from my uh, my mother uh, at least one way to do doing this. I'm going to present two different ways. One is uh, my mom's ways way, and the other way is going to be a little bit more uh, tricky or I think uh, not a lot of people use it. And there is a reason why. Um, OK, so I'm going to present the two algorithms that I'm going to present is the top in a random shuffle. And I'm, I, I want to uh, uh, just mention it quickly. So you take the top card. You have your deck of cards. Um, imagine there are 52. Uh, I lost the rest of them, but OK. So you take the top one, and then you select uniformly random, a place to put it back. Uh -huh. Let's say this place. And then I put it there. And then again, I go to the top card, and then I select a random, and then I place it somewhere with equal probability in any other places that could go back. Uh, so this is a way of, uh, of course, of like shuffling or of uh, changing the the order that it has, uh, the question is, um, yeah, how much time do I have to do this so that you feel comfortable of betting $1,000 uh, with me on a poker hand, for example. Um, so yeah, let's explore the first one, the, the, this one that I said, uh, the other one, everyone knows it, I think, or most of people use it. Okay, so it was uh, mathematically like uh, analyzed by uh, David Altus and uh, Percy Degenes in 1986. And in a paper published in the American Mathematical Monthly, um, Shuffling Cards and Stopping Times. And Stopping Times, because uh, the way the way they they like they show uh, when we we sh we could stop and be happy of being close to selecting um, a uniformly random order of the fifty two cards, uh, they they use it with stopping times and stopping times is a way of selecting an event, for example, the event that the bottom card appears uh, on top, this is an event, this is a stopping time, uh, stop when the bottom card appears on top, uh, this would be a stopping time, and then we don't know where it's going to happen if I start shopping us uh, with this algorithm, right? Could be, uh, could take could take a while, but also could, could never happen. Uh, there is a probability, very, very low probability that could never happen. So, yeah, um, they proved that it is needed n log n uh, for uh, for shuffling a deck with n cards, and uh, the usual deck is fifty two cards, so that will take around uh, two hundred shuffles. Um, so I guess no one playing poker or playing with family games will want to be shuffling cards with this procedure, right? Because it's going to take 200 shuffles to be able to say, OK, let's play the next hand. Uh, yes, and um, uh, this is this is one of the examples that I think is possible to have some intuition of why, at least why this is the, the, the rate. So if we have n cards, I have to wait around n, the number of cards, multiply by the logarithm uh, of n, mm -hmm. natural logarithm. So um, yeah, let's uh, let's let's look a bit about it uh, on that. So so stopping times is going to be when the bottom card uh, appears on top. This is the, the last time we want to wait. Uh, but first of all, we want okay when when the first card is going to 
go uh, on top and and so on and so forth until the last one and so in the first time uh, what we have to do is select from n the waiting time is is n and then once we do that uh, one could prove that uh, is n over two and then n over three and then n over four and if we factorize n we have n times one uh, one over two, one plus one over two plus one over three plus, and this is a, um, the the expression of logarithm. So it's n log n. So it has to do with the uh, with the stopping times on when you have the cards going uh, on top. Okay, so it doesn't matter if it was not uh, completely clear why is n log n, but with this shuffling procedure. Important thing to know is that it takes around 200 shuffles or uh, n log n. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but the usual procedure that I think everyone has seen uh, playing with friends and family is one called the rifle shuffle. And uh, it was introduced um, in the mathematical community around uh, 1955. And it was uh, three mathematicians, uh, Gilbert, Shannon, and Ritz, um, yeah, that they did a, a mathematical modeling of it. So what happens with this ripple, I'm going to explain it. Uh, and it's very famous among uh, mathematicians. Um, so what you do is you cut somewhere. In, you want to have like half half of the deck of the cards. And then what you do is you shuffle like this. I'm terrible at this. Huh? So I apologize because I know there are experts here on shuffling. And then you do this and then you uh, and then you have something like this where it were like some of them start getting um, in between the, the, the other part of the deck and then yes. So this is the, the refill shuffle. And in a in a kind of follow-up paper of, of the previous paper, uh, Dave Bayer and Percy Diaconis in 1992, uh, publishing in Annals of Applied Probability, uh, the shuffling time or how long do we have to wait to be kind of happy enough with something from the uniform distribution. And uh, I want to mention that I'm uh, given the time and the audience, I will not uh, I will not precisely define what we mean by uh, converging to the uniform distribution or happily enough to something from the uniform distribution, but uh, all the results that I have said is uh, with total variation distance, but there are other ways of measuring um, that are very interesting, like uh, like information, losing information on, on the shopping and other ways. But right now I'm, I'm sticking to to this model. Um, so yes, for refill shuffle, uh, it is around a constant uh, log base two times n. So instead of multiplying by n, we're multiplying by a constant. So of course it takes less time. And, and uh, for example, for 52 shuffles, it takes around seven shuffles. Uh, they prove with, with the way they model it. Um, and there are a lot of um, different approaches, uh, even with the same total variation distance with variations of deciding how, how good humans are actually doing this shuffling. Um, and yeah, I, I, think, I want to thank also James Prop because he pointed out uh, that it will depend um, on, on the model, uh, but between five and 13 shuffles, uh, I will say is, is when it's considered um, shuffle. So mathematically, with, with some mathematical model, this is, uh, this is the conclusion that we have. And I guess it, this is how people play usually. They do shuffle at least five, six times, I don't know. Um, okay, great. So, um, so I, I just started talking about shuffling, but we were talking about um, how to sample polyaminos. And the point is that 
uh, when we're playing cards, we don't have like a list of the of all the possible ways of placing the 52 cards. We do know how many there are, how many ways of uh, having a deck of cards uh, in certain order is 52 factorial, but we definitely don't have uh, the 52 factorial list and we do not select uniformly random one of those. So we have these other ways of doing some procedure of mixing uh, the, the, the object that we want to sample or the objects or the order in such a way that we can uh, that we can uh, like use it as if we were or trying to as if we were selecting uniformly random from all possibilities. And so with polyominoes, um, perhaps you could say, yeah, but we don't know how many there are there. Um, yep, yeah, but let's let's try it anyways. Um, so let's let's see uh, if if we could take a polyomino and give you another polyomino, perhaps uh, based on this polyomino with a simple rule, because these these rules that we have for shuffling are very clear. What we do, uh, like here, there is a very clear rule: take the the uppermost one uh, card and then place it uniformly random in one of the places that there are. Uh -huh. So I will give you a very clear procedure: is select one of the of the squares of the polyomino, uh, for example, this square, uh, this square here, and then uh, take it out. And then look at the, at the squares that are neighboring the polyomino. So if I take out this square, I, I'm, I'm left with this uh, domino and this uh, and this polyomino with one, one square. It's okay. So these are two polyominoes, not one right now. And then I look at the neighbors. So all of these squares are the neighboring uh, squares of this structure. And I select uniformly random, that means with equal probability each one of the possible squares that are there. Okay, so imagine that uh, the one that I selected was uh, the same one that it was, it's a possibility, then I place it back, or it could happen that I select one that will disconnect and will not give me a polyomino anymore. Um, and in that case, what I do is I place it back as well where it was. So at the end, what we are doing is kind of shuffling polyominoes is I have a polyomino and I do a procedure and you have another polyomino. What I have here is a deck of cards that has an order. I do a procedure and then you have the deck, uh, another order of the deck of cards. So the objects here, uh, the complete set of the objects is uh, all possible ways of having this deck of cards order it. And uh, here we're thinking of the all possible polyominoes that we have with a certain number of tiles. And um, we want to be able to shuffle them and then to stop at some point uh, and then to say, okay, yeah, we're happy. So let's shuffle again uh, one more time, just to, just to make sure that we, uh, we follow up. So we have this polyomino again, because this is where we were left in the last, uh, in the previous shuffle. And then let's say that this time we select this tile uh, with probability one over four, because all of them have equal probability. And then I, we take it out and then we look at the neighbors, okay? And then uh, we select one of these neighbors, let's say this one was selected and then we place it back. So this procedure went, uh, this time we shuffled and we went from this polyomino to this polyomino. Uh -huh. So we could keep to actually we could uh, we could for sure give the tiles um, the for for the Tetris in in this way. Okay, so um, just uh, wanted to mention the 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 name of these uh, of of this kind of ways of uh, sampling uh, structures is called Markov change, Monte Carlo Metropolis testing algorithms, and um, yeah, Markov chain is. Uh, like a graph, uh, or can be can be thought of as a as a graph. And uh, what we do with these procedures is that we have a polyomino, uh, all, all all polyominoes of the set, each one of those representing a vertex, and then we connect two of them. If we can go from one to 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 the to another one, um, 
with with a shuffle uh, procedure that we described, and uh, we start doing random walks or like yeah doing random walks in this in this graph. So this is basically um, another way of describing what we said. And so I guess the point now uh, will be okay. How long do I have to shuffle? Um, because we already know that we have exponentially many polyominoes with a given number of tiles, right? So it it will be scary <laughs> if we have to shuffle for an exponential amount of time. Um, yeah, so we need to explore. Let me give you another example of shuffling so that we can see that uh, what's the, the the mixing time that is known for that one as well. So let's say that you have a clock. And in a clock, you want to sample uh, uniformly again, uh, uniformly random. You want uh, that means with equal probability, uh, one of the one of the times that the clock is giving the hours. Mm -hmm. And so what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna start anywhere you want, and then with probability one half, you add one hour, and probability one half, you subtract one hour. Mm -hmm. And so you keep doing this, and then you can imagine how the um, how you are uh, like like moving on the on the clock, and selecting selecting the time. And then the question is, how long do we have to shuffle? Well, if we have an odd number of hours on the clock that we're imagining, uh, then the order is n squared, um, and that's not good, right? At, at least if, if we were in the same situation with polyominoes, we will have uh, the number of elements here in, uh, the number of, of hours that our clock have uh, will be exponential uh, to the power of two. So uh, the function that is exponential instead of n. And again, this, I mean, we cannot shuffle an exponential amount of time uh, for a given number of tiles. We don't want that. So this is a very this is a very easy example. It's a very simple uh, shuffling procedure of sampling uh, an hour from a clock, and it takes a polynomial time with respect to the number of elements that we want to sample. So this is kind of not giving us hope uh, on being able to shuffle only uh, like a reasonable amount of time polynomials to sample them. Um, Yes, so uh, I want to I want to stop here to see if there are some questions or comments, um, but uh, with also with a question to to the to, to, for think about it. Um, what happens if n is even? So if I have uh, what I said is if n is odd. If I have an odd amount of um, of hours in my clock of possible hours in my clock then the shuffle time is of this order, but what, what happens if n is even? Why am I making the assumption of n being odd? So yeah, I'm gonna let perhaps people to ask some questions or just uh, stop here to see if there are some comments. So thank you for, for this very uh, elegant uh, presentation. We have some comments throughout the talk, uh, which were already guessing where, where you were going. Uh, so, for instance, the Markov chains uh, had been mentioned uh, when, when you asked if someone uh, wanted to, to give a guess how to, to shuffle. Um, let me see if I get it right this time. Um, yeah, so it's actually very easy, is we don't know. So, we don't know. <laughs> uh, we think it's of the order of n cube, with n being the number of tiles. Uh, but it's an open question, it's an open problem, and um, I guess it's the kind of things that I would like to keep doing uh, through my life, or mathematical life, that I, I want to be both equal, my life and my mathematical life. Uh, so yes, so, so it is believed that it is of the order of n cube, n being the number of tiles. So this is, this is, this is good news, actually because the number of tiles is at n, but the number of polyominoes that have n tile is, polyno is, is, is exponential. So at least the community thinks 
or we believe uh, that it is of the order of n cube. And let me show you some uh, some pictures of voluminous that uh, I shuffle. So um, I'm gonna go quickly. Uh, so I can come back to this if there are some questions, but these are the pictures that I wanted to show you. Um, so this is with the with some tweaking the model that I showed um, uh, at the beginning. So, okay. uh, tweaking the comment that I uh, that I that I showed at the beginning. This is the kind of, um, of polyominoes that are already sampled with n cubes. So these are uh, four thousand nine uh, nine hundred tiles in each one of these polyominoes. And the p that we presented at the beginning, uh, the probability that you that you place a tile or or not is uh, is p here. It starts very close to zero, and then uh, it it grows to one. So we're making a sample, and this is how they look when we change p. And um, yeah, uh, there is a way of um, of doing this with this procedure of shuffling that I that I mentioned. And uh, one of the one of the questions that I like asking here is uh, is how many how many holes, for example, uh, they have. There are topological properties that we can study, and community are very interested in in these structures. And um, also another question is uh, if I want to create the maximal number of holes in these structures, how do they differ from these random structures? And um, yeah, so um, another, yeah, there are a lot of geometrical and topological questions about these structures and polyominoes are used for, uh, for modeling um, polymers, for example. And so, yeah, people on the uh, physicians and, and uh, phys physicists and 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 people from chemistry and um, yeah, people in uh, natural sciences are, are very interested in this kind of structures. So I guess I'm gonna stop here, Diego, just to see if there are some questions. Uh, if a polyform is defined as a connection on just a single edge, is there a simple method to count uh, the varieties? For example, the block um, tetromino, uh, tetromino is actually a U. Uh, um, and there are five different ways to add another square, including one with an overlap. Is there any easy way to count these? I have determined uh, that each of, and this is the, 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 the person commenting, I have determined that each one of these corresponds to a distinct uh, tetraflexagon, and then for each distinct poly, uh, polymanond, um, there is a distinct hexaflexagon. Uh, the comment was, uh, was by Red Dupree. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm definitely interested in 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 this question. Uh, I think there is an, there is not an easy answer. I'm not into counting actually. I'm into uh, statistically saying things uh, about the structures. So, for example, what is the expected number of holes? Um, as as uh, how does it behaves when the number of squares goes to infinity? But um, uh, also on extremal structures. So perhaps I could show uh, I could show some of the extremal structures that I think it is possible to count there. So let me go to to the extremal structures that I was showing here. So for example, this is an extremal structures that has uh, maximally many holes. Uh, this is a polyomino that has maximally many holes for a given amount of, of squares. And uh, the same here uh, with uh, with pol uh, with polyamonds, and then um, we were able, for example, to establish unicity of this structure. So I don't know with uh, with the kind of combinatorial um, the combinatorial structures that you are uh, interested. I think it will be possible. Mm. Yeah, but also I, I don't know how to establish that two are equal with this like flexing. Uh, like like there is something that is not related to 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 symmetry, but to movement to the term 
to determine when one is equivalent to another one, right? If I'm correct uh, there, but yeah, let's talk about it. I'm 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 interested in that question. Yeah. Also, there is a, there is an app uh, that we were not able to play with um, to actually generate some polyominoes. Um, so um, I will share that as well. So let me go to the uh, the, the question that was asked about. Um, the other other procedure that starts with one tile and then you start adding tiles and this is a, a, a joint work with uh, Feather Manning and ben, ben, Benjamin Schwenhart we just published uh, uh, it's an, in the archive this work and you start with a tile and then you select uniformly random one tile of the neighboring tiles with probability one over four so let's imagine that that got selected and then you put that tile and then you have equal probability again of on the six neighboring tiles to select one and put it so you keep doing that and this is the kind of structures that you get if you keep going uh so this is 1000 tiles and uh, i think if i remember correctly uh but a certain amount of times and then you stop and then this is another way of sampling a polyomino uh huh, and and it's a very easy way. Now we now it's faster. It's, it's super fast. But the question is, what is the distribution that is behind uh, this random polyomino? And and now uh, it's completely different. A completely different distribution from the other distribution that we presented, and definitely a different distribution from the uniform distribution. Um, and and the nice thing is that here we don't have to wait n cube times. The time is just computing time is just n, and well, some some other it's it's not that it's not immediately n it has a little bit because you need to be able to have the perimeter and select uniformly random from the perimeter. Da, da, da. But anyways, we can go very 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 big uh, structures, and this is started in first pass percolation and uh, it's called the Eden model, and. They are fine in nature, like if you're walking around, you can find uh, these kind of structures. So in, 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 in nature, in Lichen, and uh, this is a picture that we took uh, from a Lichen, and this is one that we uh, sample. So just to, just to have an idea uh, of how, how accurate is this modeling, um, this kind of uh, biological phenomena. And, um, yeah, so so I think this was the model that was um, suggested by by another person, and and we also we also look at the topology here, and the number of holes is very different than from the than from something from the from the uniform distribution or the percolation distributions. Yes, so I hope I answered that question. So with this. Um... We thank you very much again, Erika, uh, for this very, very elegant talk and, and very interesting one as well. And hopefully uh, we, we will see more soon. And, and I think everyone is looking forward to, to go through your talk in, in more detail on, on the platform that, that you presented it on. So thank you very much. Thanks, Diego, and thanks to the organizers. <laughs>